uh, Earth-like. The uh, question of whether Earths are rare and life is rare, complex life, the rare Earth arguments, and then this question of could we identify life either remotely on planets around other stars or within our own solar system. So maybe we could use those to sort of focus the discussion. And I, you know, neither, none of us, I think, wants to give another spiel, at least no. I don't. So uh, I think we should just open it up to questions. And if there are no questions, we'll have another spiel. <laughs> and last, last one. Marcus. Uh, Tom, the, the, the critical is really to get to n equal to, as I think uh, John phrased it, so to find one other uh, life uh, form. And I'm still wondering what, what will we have to find to be sure this is life? Yes, that's the problem. Um, and, and, and I heard a lot of of answers, and then that depends, I think, really on whether you focus on, on life as we know it on Earth, so surface life as we know it on Earth. And I mean, I have, I have to worry a lot about these things for, for other reasons, but I was, I'm a bit on the pessimistic side at the moment because I have the feeling that on exoplanets we will only be able to see atmospheres at best, and then we will have through the atmosphere to deduce life on the surface. And, and how do we do that? Well, what is the what is the composition I need to find to say, to, to convince everybody else, hey, th there's life out, of, out there? Mm -hmm. yep. So, you know, that's, I think your, your question is, is very good, and uh, I think there's a big difference between remote life detection on planets around other stars and life detection on bodies within the solar system. Because within the solar system, including Titan, you can go there, it may take a long time, but you can go there and really look in situ, whereas what you just said is correct for extrasolar planets, it's just atmospheric signatures. And so my argument, whenever I give a talk on this, I, I argue that you know for the extrasolar planets, you want to take a more conservative definition of life, and because the only thing that, that I can think of that we would get evidence for is when you have a planet in the habitable zone and you see metabolic products like oxygen and methane that we know about on, on the Earth, then you can infer something about life. But maybe you guys have a different I, I, view. I, for those of you who are studying exosolar planets who have some time, I think we have to move away from, I, I, I think, just thinking about atmosphere chemistry. And I really do think that First of all, going back to your question, because we don't have a definition of life, we have no idea how to define an N2. And so we're going to have to use first principles as to look at what we think are canonical characteristics. But the point that I want to make is that, and I've expressed my bias, I don't think you can have an origin of life, nor do I think you can support uh, a, a really broad-based evolution that can lead to complexity without plate tectonics and water. If I were doing exosolar planet modeling of any kind, I would try to understand as much as possible about those processes and in the early stages of planetary development, what conditions would be necessary to create plate tectonics. Uh, and I don't, I, mean, I don't, I can't tell you that. I don't, I know a lot about earth plate tectonics, but I, I don't know what set of conditions would be necessary to create them, and whether or not we can actually see that, either in the rotation or in the presence of other planetary bodies rotating around the sun, is there some set of conditions that would make the probability of, of something within an AU distance uh, uh, to the sun you know, that's feasible for, for life of any kind to maintain water? Is there something that we could come up with that, that would be a model of that? I, my one suggestion would be to find some n number, like three to six or seven planets that are basically at the same AU from the same kind of sun, and do as much comparative analysis of those as possible, and see if one stands out as being different. I just wonder how, uh, you know, if you have the right mass planet, and it's in the rocket design, isn't it almost inevitable that you're going to end up with a star, uh, with a planet that has an active surface? And plate tectonics, I mean, the reason that Venus has a static grid is because it's was so hot and it lost all of its water. So to me, it just seems like it's a matter of finding lots of planets uh, at the right distance from their host stars and with the right mass. Well, okay, so everything I've heard from my colleagues here, which have been 
stated as assertions, I regard as hypotheses. So you hypothesized that Venus doesn't have plate tectonics because it got hot and it developed a stable lid. It's a leading hypothesis, but we don't know whether, in fact, that's why it happened. And unfortunately, we're unlikely, I think, to really understand the geophysics of planets from any type of terrestrial planet finder, at least anything that you know we can think of designing anytime soon. So that's a problem. So because of that, um, I, I, first of all, I agree that in looking at extrasolar planets, we probably want to first test the hypothesis that the Earth is not unique, that there are other planets with an environment like the Earth for whatever reason that have what appear to be all of the ingredients to support life. They're habitable. And that's the fundamental goal of TPF. We need to really, really push on that because there's a tremendous amount of progress being made now, and, and I think we're getting there. You know, in spite of these little setbacks, uh, like TPF being canceled and so on and so forth, in the mainstream, the progress has just been incredible, and, and we do not want to lose our focus on this. We were discussing this outside over coffee. Um, we've got to make sure that the case can be made that you know, the Earths are, are frequent enough, uh, the data are good enough to say that, uh, and um, that we understand well enough uh, what Earth-like life does to an atmosphere, that we can make a spectrum of a planet around another star that has the same size as the Earth, is in the right AU region, and be able to evaluate that spectrum, analyze it, and make some meaningful statements. And I think we can do that, and that's the case that has to be made. Uh, and um, I'm optimistic. Someone said to me outside I was a pessimist, but I'm, I'm actually an optimist. I think that you know this will happen in the next 20 years, but it requires steady progress. It requires keeping people excited uh, because the progress in exoplanets and what's being done now uh, continues uh, in um, uh, the fashion that it has as we move forward toward TPF. Um, so that's kind of long-winded, but let me say it in a simpler way. Um, we have to make sure we don't design our ambitions so that we have one huge thing at the end and nothing in the middle. We've got to have steps in the middle that keep the excitement going, that increase our knowledge of the, the frequency and occurrence of planets and lead us to uh, something that will be able to make a spectrum of an Earth-sized planet in the next 20 years. Yeah, so if I could just say one thing more, you have to focus on observables. Plate tectonics itself is just not observable uh, from a distance. It's observable with Venus because we can get send a spacecraft up there and do radar imaging of it, but you, you can't do that for an exoplanet. Uh, the closest you can come, actually, is what Nick Cowan has done with the epoxy mission for Earth. If you get a, a time series in color photometry, he's able to show that you can that epoxy is looking, you, you mentioned it, Jonathan, it's looking back at the Earth from the outer solar system. Someone else mentioned that. That's okay, uh, so, uh, so e by getting a time series on the, the data, you can tell what the percentage of continents and oceans is. And that's an indirect uh, indicator of plate tectonics. So you can sort of get at it, but not directly. I guess I'm, I'm even more optimistic. I, I, it, primarily because of the length of time I've been in science and to see how technology and new ideas which can be translated into technology really happen. I don't think we know enough about plate tectonics to know if there's some kind of a sign that that particular exoplanet is, is going through plate tectonics. And I don't think we should just lock ourselves into the current technology. I, Jonathan is absolutely correct. Part of this intermediate steps that are going to come before we make some big discovery is going to come with technological innovation. And, and certainly we're still working on ways to get better spectra even of the, of, of, of the atmosphere. But I do think eventually we're going to be able to say something much more about the planet itself. And having talked to some of you younger people involved in exo, exosolar planets, I have all the confidence in the world that you're going to come up with that. So, and, and that's going to, it might take 10 or 20 years, but that's going to happen. Svetlana's got a question. Um, there is uh, another uh, indirect evidence for plate tectonics is the presence of magnetic fields on the planet. Because the magnetic field is generated in the liquid core, which means that there is a warm mantle and then probably plate tectonics. That's the indirect evidence. 
Well, I have a counter to that, which is, first of all, Jupiter's moon Ganymede has an intrinsic magnetic field. It has a dipolar magnetic field, and there's no evidence of plate tectonics on its surface. Um, so I'm not sure that those two necessarily go together. The other problem, of course, is that it would be really, really hard to detect a magnetic field <coughs> of the strength of the Earth around a planet that's 10 parsecs away. I'm not sure how you would do that. In the case of Jupiter, which has a powerful magnetic field, you know, you have the chance of detecting uh, uh, very long wavelength uh, radio waves, kilometric radiation, and so on. But I don't think one can do that with a terrestrial planet. Well, there is one option, for instance, like on round world, they see now uh, auroras, and yeah. radiation, uh, radio signals with yeah. auroras, you can see it maybe on Okay, I'm skeptical, but let's look at the, yeah, we, should, we need to look at all these possibilities, absolutely, I'll say that. Can we have substitutes for plate tectonics and can volcanism stuff? Yeah. Well, you, you know, I, we didn't talk much about that, but I think, yes, from, from a climate standpoint, you just simply have to have a ge <coughs> geologically active surface so that you recycle carbonates back into CO2. Uh, and that you can do with point volcanism on a stagnant lid planet. Now there may be other reasons you need plate tectonics to get life going or to provide, if you have continents, then you can weather them and get the phosphorus out. Uh, There's some water rock reactions that are really crucial, I think, in plate tectonics and the formation of, of the, you know, the minerals and the, and the wide variety of settings. Uh, it, it, the, ge the geochemical and geophysical cycles that go on as a result of plate tectonics are just vital in maintaining the Earth as it is, as a, as a, a nutrient-rich environment for life. Uh, I, can't, I cannot imagine a non-plate tectonically active body mm -hmm. supporting life. The general, the general thing you need is you need to be able to recycle Exactly. volatiles. And, you know, we call it plate tectonics, but it's got to be some process that moves stuff that has been dumped down below the crust into the hotter regions where it can be reconverted and moves new stuff up, and that's what you need. By the way, I'm wondering if this might not be possible with the right kind of spectra. Uh, you know, looking, for example, Jovian Aurora you see in H3+. Plus. Uh, so, Maybe there are some signatures. I think it's going to depend on the spectral resolution. But uh, if the planet's oriented in the right way, and you look at the night side, for example, um, might be an interesting calculation. So it might, it might actually work. Yeah, we have to distinguish between what's doable in the near term, by which I mean the next 20 or 30 years, and what's doable beyond that. There is this uh, French scientist, La Bure, who has these elaborate plans for super TPF missions where you've got dozens of spacecrafts separated out going around the inner solar system acting as an interferometer. And so, you know, eventually we may be able to do incredible things. Uh, it just takes a long time. But we want to do really incredible things that are somewhat smaller in scope within our own lifetimes. Right. That's the selfish that, part of it. So. But that's already happening. And so if we continue at the rate that we're going right now, there's new discoveries being made. Um, obviously an exosolar planet work every, every few months almost. And I think we're going to be really, we're going to have a lot of surprises in the next five years, I think just on that topic, let alone biology, let alone uh, regarding the origin of life. Yeah, maybe changing the subject a bit, but there is one step that we did not speak this week, is the, the, the switch between life and what we might call intelligent life, although sometimes we wonder, that is human beings. After all, life, you know, the human beings is very recent, only, what, maybe six million years. Uh, so what happened that suddenly one our ancestors started to develop a big brain uh, is a very, I think, a very interesting question. And also, is it likely to, to reproduce elsewhere? And there are people that have thought about that. One of the obvious answers is, well, it was helping to survive in, you know, Environments. But if it's really true, why other species have not developed such a big brain? So, and there are other alternatives which are uh, proposed, and, and uh, one of them is this uh, kind of sexual selection, like the pe peacock tail. Uh, I think that's quite speculative, but I find I find those those things very uh, interesting. So, I don't know if you have comments on that. 
But, you know, I, I don't think other species are that far behind us, really. Uh, you know, I, I think what primates, we come from primates, we are primates. Uh, primates really started to flourish over the last 50 or 60, well, 30 million years, right? They, they came in late during the, during the Cenozoic, and so it, and then there's, you know, there's dogs and there's dolphins and chimpanzees that, given a few more tens of millions of years, uh, they might well make it up to our stage. Yeah, I think the, the, again, I don't want to give a full lecture on this, but there is, a, there is a, some really nice papers on the evolution of intelligence. And we see, for example, uh, I mentioned that animal that lives anaerobically, that's fairly small, and doesn't even have mitochondria. For its size, it has about 20% of its mass is a little brain. So it already has developed, you know, as a brain. And in some of the smallest invertebrates, like a planaria, which is one of the simplest invertebrates, it actually has a, a kind of a, a notochord area, a group of nervous nerve-type tissues that act as a sort of proto-brain. So very early on, uh, something that helps regulate even very, very little behavior that certain animals have, it helps to control that. Uh, shows signs of early brain formation. I showed my favorite animal, of course, the octopus, which is an invertebrate, which has the largest brain of any invertebrate. It's a huge brain. Uh, the social behavior, communication skills, etc., of an octopus, if it had found a way to live more than a few years, let's say it, uh, you had a 50 to 80 year old octopus, they would have societies. I guarantee you, they're that smart. I mean, they, they would be interacting at very, very, at very, very complex. They'd be in the water, but they, because they already do that. And if they actually had a way to learn from each other. I'm just saying that, I, I don't know the potential. If, if we never came about, would there be some, something other than primates that could have actually, you know, been something different? Could you actually have microbial intelligence? We have the beginning of that already. John, I want to ask you about the biological part of the Drake equation because you, the, the impression I'm getting from your lectures is that it's really complicated. But I'm also getting that um, you fo you know, you should, we should be focusing on bottlenecks because the formation of eukaryotes seems to be F equals to 1 right, from your lectures. So what are the three bottlenecks that you would focus on? That's a really good question. Uh, and so do I get another PhD if I answer that? <laughs> so the three, the three big bottlenecks, as I said, one, the, the big bottle, the first big bottleneck is timing. <coughs> uh, and we would never have complex life if we had not evolved oxygenic photosynthesis. So that's, that's, a, that's a crucial, that's a, one of the most crucial stages. And, and that's a timing issue. Maybe it's inevitable after you run out of of uh, sources of, of electrons to reduce CO2 like we had early on. I've made the point to somebody else that if we had a different kind of Earth that had uh, far less influx of hydrogen, hydrogen sulfide, uh, iron, for example, oxygenic photosynthesis may have occurred much earlier, in which case we would have sped up the evolution of the eukaryotes. Because I think those symbiosis and fusion ideas are, are inevitable. The second big bottleneck is so, okay, we, we, there's some things we know about eukaryotes, like they have uh, an archaeal nucleus and they have a lot of housekeeping genes that are bacteria, but the overwhelming majority of their genes and how they actually work to be complex and to live in communities that can change and form shapes uh, are huge gaps. Uh, and we don't know how long that took and we don't know what sets of conditions. So if you see that tree of life, if you remember it, you have bacteria and archaea, and then you have eukaryotes coming off. But the tree of life has this giant, huge branch, which is essentially time, with nothing, no little branches on it. And what, what that is, is going from something like this eukaryotic fusion, mitochondria and chloroplasts, all bacteria, and suddenly, you have individual chromosomes, you undergo mitosis and meiosis, you have sex, you differentiate into body parts. By, you have a set of things that uh, happen that we don't know how they happen. For example, the ribosome, uh, 
which we use these terms like Svedberg units. Svedberg is the inventor of the uh, 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 ultracentrifuge. And so different ribosomes, if you put them on a cesium chloride gradient, for example, they will come down at, depending on their size and shape. And so bacteria and archaea have what we call 70S or 70 Svedberg unit ribosomes, but the eukaryotes are bigger, they're 80S. And while they have a lot of overlap with the archaea, they, they have really made some serious evolutionary changes just in the ribosome. And we don't know that what, how that happened and why they made their RNAs bigger, uh, for example. So um, that's a big bottleneck, and, and that's where, where we're going. Uh, I would like to also point out that, to me, the biggest bottleneck in understanding the origin of life, to go even uh, you know, further back to, to the origin of life, the biggest bottleneck for me right now is the origin of the ribosome. Mm -hmm. Until we understand the origin of the ribosome, we're not going to understand anything, really, about the origin of life and how it actually formed. And I think, you know, my personal judgment is that we're making a big mistake by, in the origin of life community of saying, I just want to deal with my replicator and find some way to make it work, or I want to get a metabolic network that's going to do something for me, or I want magic to happen in a soup. It's not going anywhere. It never will go anywhere until we actually think about how all of those processes have interacted right from the beginning and formed, and so that the ribosome itself evolved. You know, I gave you my prejudice. I think the RNA world was a proto-ribosome. A, a ribosome. It had RNA. It had protein, uh, and you can't help it. I mean, every time you make an RNA, you have an anti-codon site, a three-code that if you have amino acids floating around, it can bind to it. And so what you want is something that, if you make RNA randomly today, it'll just fold in every kind of direction. There's no, it, 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 it just, it's a gemisch. It's not going to do anything for you. So, so those are the three that I have. The ribosome, uh, the timing, the emergence of the, uh, the chloroplast, and, which is important because from oxygen came the mitochondrial bacterial symbiont. And then all the unknown aspects that go from that fusion symbiosis to the complexity of, of, of eukaryotes that allow them to uh, differentiate and form complex organisms. Those are three huge bottlenecks. Can I change the subject for one minute? Oh, you had a response to that. No. Oh, I, I actually, I, there's so many people in this audience who do exoplanet searches, and we've sort of sat up here and pontificated a little bit about exoplanets in this particular session. I wonder if maybe Deborah and Stefan and a couple of others could actually stand up and in two or three sentences say which way they think the field should be going at the moment to make the most progress. That, I think that would actually be useful. It only take five minutes, so... Why didn't Deborah go first? We've been talking about this, of course, on the dinner and, Good. and wine, All right. <laughs> and more wine. And, uh, and, and you know, I, I really do think that what's happened here in Europe is a great thing, that the, the Geneva team has, you know, by building harps, um, has really broken me down. I do live in an atmosphere, because I have this perspective, a, a long perspective, and so one of the things that I've seen is that for a long time, people have said, the floor of the uh, Doppler precision is three meters per second because that's what their precision was. And then the floor was, you know, two meters, and then it was one meter. Um, and, the, what I, and, and the difference, and, and they've influenced the U.S. community to a great extent uh, by saying this and by, by sort of seeding this impression that that's as well as you can do and why would you spend whatever. And so there's a completely different approach that's been taken by the by the Geneva team, and that's just to say we're going to push as hard as we can to get the instrumental precision to one centimeter per second. And one of the things that my group has done um, at Yale is to build a synthetic code, and we show that using the iodine spectrum and the NSO atlas, and everything is perfect. You've got no signal to noise. You can get back. Uh, one to two centimeter per second precision. The information is there in the spectrum, okay? And so now, where do things go wrong? Well, we don't have as much signal to noise, you know, we have lower resolution, so now we can be, begin to explore that parameter space. 
And so, I, uh, again, you know, I think the right thing that's happened, and you see, you know, what's going to happen in the next 10 years, right? That espresso is going to come online in, a, in another, uh, I don't know how many years, maybe years, maybe? Maybe five years, is that right? Or? Yeah, 2016. Yeah, okay. And then, you know, and then the Codex plans are, are being made right now uh, for, for that on a, on a larger, you know, 30 meter telescope. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, that's where I think the field has to go. And it might be with this technique, and uh, there might be other ways. Um, you know, I think we might actually diverge a little bit on, on exactly how you would do it. But I think that the key is getting the instrumental precision down so that you know you're below the floor of the stellar noise instead of just claiming more. Actually, to complement and to give another perspective, I think that we think now that the, the key point is to do as much as different type of information you can get. Yes. So we have the Kepler results that are enthusiastic. <coughs> we are learning a lot. But we see also very clearly what the limitation is in the Kepler data. It's in the faintness of the star that do not allow to go further. Yeah. And in parallel with the development that she just mentioned on radial velocities, they are going for the transit for bright stars, having the capability of doing the confirmation to get the mass and, and start the walls of spectroscopy is the way to go. And in Europe, we, had, we were thinking about what should be the development in space, science, uh, the exoplanet domain for the next 15 to 20 years. And we did this exercise. And the three main highways are detection, uh, characterization of the structure of the planet, and characterization of the atmosphere. And uh, when we go from giant planet to low mass planet, it's getting increasingly difficult. Yes. And of course, going to characterization from detection to character detection also, it's more difficult. And uh, both are converging for to the low mass planet in the habitable zone around solar type star yeah. to get to habitability. And that's good to have this body grade because it's pushing all the effort at the same time. And at the end, when we will be detecting one planet, uh, to be able to say it's habitable or not, we have to understand the complete landscape, what is happening on the super Earth, 5, 10 Earth masses, and uh, know about the, uh, what kind of atmosphere we expect on, on them. So it, it will be linked to outgazing of the, of the planet, so it will be linked to the structure of the planet, it will be linked on the climate model of the planet, and it's only when putting everything together that we get uh, maybe a clear view of it. So that's how we are trying to push the field now. Excellent. Thank you. Well, that gives me a lot of cause for optimism. Great. Yeah, me too. Yep. So since, yeah, go ahead. You're next. So we, we discussed that uh, in a too much changing environment, complex life is probably not possible. The question is, in a very stable environment, do you think that um, evolution to complex life would be possible so there is no big um, evolutionary pressure? in such an environment, like on Titan, that is very stable, probably. Life creates multiple conditions. If you start life under one set of conditions, it changes. And so what you've, you know, you can even track some of those progressions. But it's, it's kind of an interesting to get back to the, the Titan issue, and I'm actually glad that you, you brought that up, because I think it, it is important. And you pointed out this absence of n equals 2 is really a, a huge bottleneck for us in terms of knowing the possibilities. We, can't, we can only imagine possibilities, but we can't really uh, know for sure you know, what the possibilities are. Titan gives us that laboratory. And so it's really interesting. Uh, we don't have a definition of life, and there may not be life in any of the canonical characteristics that I mentioned, which is, I said would be carbon-based, uh, that I said would have to replicate and would undergo Darwinian evolution to create. Those are the three canonical characteristics of life. They may not happen there, other than carbon for sure, and something that can reproduce perhaps itself might actually go on. But until we actually look, that's why I'm excited about Titan, it offers us a really out-of-the-box experimental place. And like Jonathan mentioned, we could land there, we just go right there, we don't worry about contamination or anything, and, and we can do experiments. And if we put the right people together, I guarantee you we can set up a bunch of life experiments that could go in there, because we're, 
we're there. We're landed there. We're not worried about contaminating it. And, and uh, so, you know, if we had more time, I'd like to actually even map out what the mission would be like to actually take a look at, mm -hmm. at these processes. I'd like, you know, somebody else to talk about that. I have a po proposal group that you can join right now, by the way. And actually, before, let, me, let me add to that. Don't assume the Titan is stable and unchanging. One of the points that Cassini has allowed us to see is that there are seasonal and Milankovitch type time scales on which these lakes are shrinking and expanding. We actually see one of those lakes shrinking in response to seasonal uh, insulation from the sun. So there are cycles that are occurring on the surface. It's not an unchanging surface. You, I think, Jonathan, you said that disequilibria are some, somehow a sign for something interesting happening. Now, especially for Titan, there's this uh, disequilibrium of uh, there, there's uh, ethane, which is uh, 100 to 1,000 times underabundant. Mm -hmm. um, do we understand that in some way, or might that be actually pointing to something interesting? Well, first of all, I think it was Jim who discussed disequilibrium as a sign of life. I discussed it as a necessary condition for um, chemistry to go on in a, in a self-complexifying way. And I agree with Jim, of course, on that. Um, no, we don't understand that. And uh, there have been um, two uh, types of explanations offered for a small set of mysteries that I put on that one view graph. Uh, the sink of hydrogen, which still needs to be confirmed, uh, the lack of acetylene, and the underabundance of, of ethane on the surface. Uh, and one of those paths uh, leads to a kind of a biological interpretation uh, where you have methanogen-like chemical systems. And the other is a completely abiotic explanation. So right now, there's not the data to decide between the two. Uh, but it's a good example of what you'd go and try to investigate further uh, with a system that's actually in place on the surface of Titan. Can, can I make a general remark uh, related to this because it's this question of how you detect life, you know, the example that I gave uh, was extreme thermodynamic disequilibrium because that's the one that you see in, on the Earth's present atmosphere, was suggested first by Lederberg a long time ago. But, but actually on the early Earth, it would be the opposite because uh, before you had oxygenic photosynthesis, you'd have organisms like methanogens, they're actually driving the atmosphere towards thermodynamic equilibrium. So you have to be careful there. The atmosphere would be predominantly CO2 and hydrogen. Without them, with them, uh, becomes a lot of methane, right? And so the other point that uh, sometimes gets, gets uh, overlooked is that all planetary atmospheres are in thermodynamic disequilibrium because they're trying to equilibrate at the thermal temperature, which for Earth is about 300 Kelvin, but you're getting these photons from the sun, which are at an effective temperature of 6,000 Kelvin, and then you get shorter wavelength ones that are even more out of equilibrium. So, uh, you know, I've heard Lynn Margulis say, she, she'll put up Venus, Earth, and Mars, and she'll say, Venus and Mars are in thermodynamic equilibrium, and the Earth is out of equi equilibrium, and therefore you can tell there's life. But the Venus and Mars atmosphere are not in thermodynamic equilibrium. Right. So you have to be careful with that criteria. Go for it. <laughs> this, is, this, is, this is a crucial question because right now uh, life on Earth as we know it has developed these, as I say, lipid membranes that are dissolved by organic solvents. That's why they don't work. Uh, doesn't mean that's the only kind of membrane configuration that can occur. Now, one of the interesting things about solvents, how organic solvents, and I actually showed this slide to, to Jonathan a while back that actually takes, looks at all the organic solvents over their temperature spectra and which ones might actually be on, uh, on, on Titan. And my whole idea in doing and, and making that particular figure, uh, which I didn't talk about, was to 
actually look and see what kinds of chemistry can go on in those different kinds of solvents. And in fact, the one reaction for one, one major uh, set of reactions, for example, is the foremost reaction, which makes a lot of uh, nucleotide bases, for example, and e even involved in making sugar, works much better in an organic solvent. Uh, a formamide, for example, which is a carbon nitrogen type of organic solvent, uh, it works really well in, in, in <coughs> uh, And proteins, many proteins are much more stable and work very well in, in organic solvents, but they still need maybe two or three percent water bound to them to, to function. My point is we haven't, I don't know of anybody who sat down and said, okay, these are all the organic solvents that are around that we can do chemical reactions in and actually map out what are those chemical reactions. And if we see some kind of chain going from, uh, let's say, one of Titan's little lakes or streams that might have one kind of organic solvent that can blend with another or with some catalytic compounds that we don't know anything about. He mentioned, uh, you know, acetylene, but if there's, we don't know anything about the nitro carbon nitrogen compound, cyanide, for example, any of those are strongly catalytic and that could have a huge effect on the complexity of the organics and be made. It's unknown and it's worth really modeling. This is something we haven't really modeled. I've been thinking about it a lot, but I haven't modeled it yet. We do know there's um, acetyl nitrile on the surface. There are, and we've seen some of those yeah. co compounds. Yeah. Just adding up to that, um, can, if, if you were now talking about solvents for life, you um, earlier on said that water is essential for plate tectonics. So is plate tectonics also possible with other solvents like ammonia or methane or whatsoever? You know, uh, I, I don't know the answer to your question, but the, the reason water is important here is water is abundant, right? Oxygen is the third most abundant element. And so it's actually for many planets, it's not that restrictive to talk about water. And, you know, so you have rocky planets like the Earth and probably Venus early on and Mars all have water in their interiors. So, you know, I don't know about, have you thought about tectonics on Titan-like objects? Uh, have circulating methane through water ice? <laughs> it's really hard because uh, water ice is so much uh, less dense than the liquid water. It's hard to make it subduct. The one way you do make it subduct, and this goes back to your question, is you make ethane clathrate hydrate because ethane clathrate is denser than liquid water. Methane clathrate is less dense, but the difference in molecular weight between methane and ethane is enough <coughs> that you would get at least the, the equivalent of Venusian flake tectonics. Remember that theory where stuff flaked off the bottom of the crust? That was Roger Phillips. So if you make a lot of ethane clathrate, that part of the crust will subduct into the liquid water ammonia ocean on Titan. So Maybe what is the proof of the a liquid ammonia ocean? So right now, um, there's evidence for an ammonia water ocean on Titan. There are two pieces of evidence. One is that Titan has an ambient electric field that was measured by Huygens. And that electric field uh, is in a, a cavity. It's a Schumann resonance, uh, which is terminated at the top by the ionosphere of Titan. The electric field declines toward the surface, but it actually is non-zero at the surface. And in a cavity like that, you want to know what the conducting boundary is at the other end. If you extrapolate down to where that, uh, the electric field would be zero based on the atmospheric measurements, it's about 50 kilometers below the surface. And that's just about where the thermal models say you would have a, a water ammonia ocean. The other evidence is still not complete yet, but the preliminary gravity data, which have looked at Titan now, when it's closest to Saturn and farthest away, so you get slight differences uh, in the shape and the moments, are consistent with um, a, a solid crust over um, a very, very weak interior, which would be a, a liquid, most, most likely a liquid ocean. The other thing about the Schumann resonances is you need a relatively high conductivity to terminate that electric field, so it wouldn't be just pure water. Water ammonia actually works quite well. So it's all circumstantial, but it's kind of tilting in the right direction. Mm. How much time do we have left? That's uh, it. I think it, yeah, Good. I, would, I would be happy to continue for okay. another couple of weeks, but I think we have to close it. Yeah. Well, so thank you, everyone. Let's thank our three speakers again. No.
Well, and I didn't get a chance to say it, but thank you all for coming. It was a pleasure to see all these physicists and astronomers learning about astrobiology. So I'm glad you all came.